Hi, everybody. My name is Aman Jan, and I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, thanks a lot to Maya and the entire DevFest team for organizing this event. My talk is titled, How to Validate Your Startup Idea Quickly. It's not a very technical talk. Uh, it's more about approaching startup problems and being smart about validating ideas without spending a lot of time. So I'm going to talk about this playbook that you can use to test your ideas in a matter of a few days without spending many months building something. But first, let me introduce myself. So I'm currently an engineering lead in the Facebook's innovation arm, where we rapidly prototype and test out new ideas. I live in San Francisco in the Bay Area, which is you know the mecca of startups. And uh, before Facebook's innovation lab, I was a founding engineer on WhatsApp. Before that, I was the first backend engineer on Instagram Live and uh, before that on Twitter. Uh, a fun fact about myself, I'm a licensed pilot and I love flying around California. So the agenda for the talk today is like very straightforward. First, I'll talk about the why. I'll explain why it's so important to quickly test your ideas before spending a lot of time building it out. Once I've convinced you that this is important, then I'll talk about the how. I'll describe a playbook you can use to test your ideas in a matter of a few days. So let's start with an unpleasant fact. So statistically speaking, about 90% of new ideas fail in the market, regardless of how promising they sound. Typically, here's how it plays out. You, you have a cool idea and you get really excited about it. And you talk to your close friends, you, you say, hey, what do you think of this idea? Would you pay for it if it existed? And your friends, because obviously they're your friends, they want to please you, they'll say, they'll just lie to you. They'll say, yeah, that's a great idea. You should totally build this out. And then you go, you build this out, you spend like three to six months building it out and you launch it. And then you're surprised that nobody wants to use your app. This is called the, the law of market failure. And I've personally faced this many times myself. Let's talk about why ideas fail. So there's obviously many reasons why ideas fail, but they can be bucketed into three different categories. First is execution. This means that the idea was good, but it was not implemented properly. This could be because the code had bugs or the algorithm wasn't good enough, or maybe the team wasn't able to launch in time. The second reason for why ideas could fail is distribution. This means that even though the product was great, you were unable to get it into the hands of the right people. So certain ideas, uh, like for example, social apps, they require enough critical mass for the app to be useful. And uh, so that's what distribution is about. And it's possible that you have a perfectly good idea, but you just haven't been able to get it into the hands of the right people, which is why it's going to fail. Um, so this could be because of a lack of marketing budget, or maybe you know you build a web app, whereas most of your users, they, have, they, you know, they, they want to use it on a mobile device. The third reason is market. This means that the execution was good and the distribution was good, but the market just didn't care about your idea. And you might think that all three of them are like equally responsible for your know, failure of your idea, but that's not the case. Most of the ideas fail because of market. Execution and distribution are not usually the main reasons. Mostly it's always a market, which is that you build something, and you build it well, and you're able to distribute it, but just the market, they don't want it. So what can be done about this? Unfortunately, there's like there's no magic bullet to predict if the market will be interested in an idea or not. But this doesn't mean that you shouldn't even try building something new. It means that you should try to de-risk your project before spending a lot of time and money building this. And then in this presentation, I'm, I'll talk about exactly that. How do you de-risk your project? Uh, I'll talk about a playbook to do that. Uh, basically, this playbook will allow you to not write a lot of code, not spend many months, but try to like validate your idea with actual data in a matter of a few days or maybe maximum a week. So let's get started. The first step is to write down your idea quickly. Uh, sorry, write down your idea clearly. Let me go through an actual example that popped in my mind during the beginning of this pandemic. So I'm used to going to work out at the gym three times a week. Now with no access to a gym, I started looking at YouTube for workout videos. 
I found that most of them were cardio based, but I actually prefer like weight training. Also, I tried to find fitness apps on my iPhone device, but none of them were really customized to the equipment I had at home because I had just some dumbbells and resistance bands, but the the, mob, the mobile app required me to like use other stuff. So I came up with an idea for an app called iFitness. iFitness will offer personalized workout plans tailored to each user's needs. The plans will be tailored based on a variety of parameters including the equipment the user already has and how much time they're willing to devote. A smart recommendation engine will be built to enable this product. So that's sort of my idea. And I've written it out quickly, uh, clearly. The next step is to convert your idea into a market engagement hypothesis. This might sound like a fancy phrase, but what it means is what do you think, how you think the market will engage with your product when it launches. This is super useful because it forces you to think about your target customer, which is the market. So in our case for the iFitness app that I talked about, here's what a market engagement hypothesis might look like. A lot of people who are quarantined at home will pay for iFitness to get personalized workout plans. So this is a small step forward. We've ident identified roughly who we think the customer is, which is people quarantined at home. But how will we objectively measure if the idea is worth building or not? We need to get a lot more specific. Step three is to convert your market engagement hypothesis into a testable numeric format. To achieve this, we use this format called the XYZ format. So the XYZ format of, is of this form, at least X person of Y who come across the iFitness app will Z, where Y is a clear description of your target audience, X is a specific percentage of your target audience, and Z is how you expect the target audience will engage with your idea. So now let's try to see how we could write the iFitness app idea in this format. So we could write something like this. Two percent of people in the U.S. aged between 25 and 44 years who come across the iFitness app will try it, and 10 percent will become monthly active customers. So in this case, the X is two percent, the Y, which is the audience, is people in the U.S. aged between 25 and 44 years. See how 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 lot more specific this is, and the Z, which is the action they will take, is they will try the app. And then 10% will become monthly active customers. This is a large step forward. We specified in a lot more detail who we think the audience is. We've also specified the percentage of the audience who we thought who we think will engage and how they will engage. Let's see what the next step is. The next step is called hyperzooming. We need to figure out a niche audience we can test our idea against. This is important because we can't test our idea against the entire audience. In our case, the audience was people in the US aged between 25 and 44 years. That's a lot of people. We can't test your idea against all of them. So what's the representative group we can test our idea against? So I know that on Facebook, the Facebook app, there is this community or a group called Bay Area Fitness. It's basically a group of people in the Bay Area who are interested in fitness. And it's got like many thousands of members. So this is a perfect group to test this against. So here's how a hyper-zoomed hypothesis might look like for our app. Two percent of people in Facebook's Bay Area fitness group who see my post about $20 iFitness subscriptions will visit our website and submit their email address addresses to be invited to the beta. So this is highly, highly zoomed. We've talked about exactly who we're going to test this against, which is Facebook's Bay Area Fitness Group. We've also sort of explained the mechanics. We'll make a post. We'll mention in that post that the iFitness subscription are $20, and we'll expect them to visit our website and submit their email address. So now, you know, just to like summarize, let's look at the evolution of iFitness. First, we started with the market engagement hypothesis, which was 
a lot of people work, a lot of working professionals who are quarantined at home will pay for iFitness subscriptions to get personalized workout plans. Next, we converted that into an XYZ format, which was two personal people in the US aged between 25 and 44 years who come across iFitness will try it and 10% will become monthly active customers. And then next, and finally, we had the hyper Zoom hypothesis, which was two percent of people in the Facebook's Bay Area fitness group who see my posts by twenty dollar iFitness subscriptions will visit our website and submit their email address to be invited to the beta. This is great. This is like a lot of progress. Now let's get to the last part, which is the most exciting one, which is now you figured out what their hypothesis is. Uh, what are some clever prototyping techniques you can use to validate or invalidate this hyper-zoomed hypothesis? So the first prototyping technique we can use is called the painted door test. The reason it's called paint, so the painted door test is like, the reason it's called that is because it's actually used in architecture a lot. When the architect is designing a building, they're trying to figure out if a certain door should be built in a certain area in the wall, they, what they do is they paint it. They, they paint a door on the wall and then try to measure how many people actually try to open it. And if there's enough people who thought, who wanted to open it, then they actually go build that door. So applying the same principle over here, what we do is we'll buy a domain for iFitness and use one of the no code tools like Squarespace to build our website. On the website, we'll explain the value proposition of iFitness and explain that the product is in beta. We'll ask the users to enter their email address to be invited to the beta. We'll post a link to this website on Facebook's Bay Area Fitness Group, and then we'll measure the number of email addresses collected and the number of people who viewed the Facebook post. Using these two numbers, we can calculate what person of people who view this, view this post actually submit their email address. And using that, we can actually validate if you know two, if it hits the two person mark or not. We can also run this experiment against multiple uh, against multiple audiences. So for example, maybe your new hypothesis is like, let's see how uh, women react to this app compared to like men. What we could do is we could find a women centric group, maybe on Reddit or somewhere, and run this app against uh, run, run this ad against them. And after running running this experiment a few times, we'll have hard numbers. We will know exactly if the market is interested in our idea or not. So that's that's great. Let's say you know we run this experiment multiple times, and you find out that it's actually hitting the two percent mark, which means that this is great news. We should move forward. But you know there's still one thing that still needs to be tested. Uh, which is that we, with the painted door test, we've proven that people will come in, they're interested, and they'll submit their email addresses. But our business model depends on the fact that people become recurring customers, which means that month after month, they come back and pay more money. Uh, how do we test that part of the hypothesis? For this, we can use another technique called the Wizard of Oz technique. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Wizard of Oz, but uh, it comes from uh, the play Wizard of Oz and also the book. It's a very popular experimentation technique where the customer interacting with the product believes the product is autonomous, but the product is actually being operated behind the scenes by a human being. How can we use this for eye fitness uh, testing the retention? So I have a good friend who who's also a fitness trainer. I'll ask him to be the wizard behind the scenes and punt on actually building the recommendation engine. So I'll make a lightweight mobile web app that accepts user preferences and a way to accept money. Behind the scenes, I'll work with my fitness trainer friend to create these workout plans and then send them in a nice and polished email back to the user. We'll do this for a little more than a month. At the end of the month, we'll ask the customer to pay for the next month via email. And using this technique, we'll be able to test the second part of hypothesis, the user retention, without actually writing that algorithm and spending a lot of time on it. And then after we run the painted door test and the wizard of us technique, I will have enough confidence that this is in fact worth building probably. Maybe I'll learn that people 
are not willing to pay for this. And I'll just like move on. I won't have wasted many months. So to summarize, we took a very vague idea, converted that into a testable hypothesis, and then we used the painted door test and the Wizard of Oz techniques to get hard numbers. And then we were able to do all of this in a few days. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, my name is Aman Jan again. Uh, and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Substack to continue the conversation.